Okay, good evening, everyone. Hey, John. Hi, Richard. There you are. <laughs> hey, that looks familiar. You're here. <laughs> Gerald, you're, Gerald, you're here, too. We're, we're, we're all here tonight. Uh, the weather was good enough. Uh, we're dodging clouds. Uh, we got some low humidity, though, so we're going to try to uh, fit in some of the highlights of the winter sky tonight. And uh, Gerald, before we get going, we want to talk about what's happening at Chabot and talk about our sponsors. And then we'll uh, start with M42 probably after that. Sure. So uh, we want to just encourage everybody to uh, continue supporting the Chabot Space and Science Center's virtual programming. We are doing quite a bit of this. You know, we do the Saturday night programs. Uh, we're doing uh, Friday night programs. We've got a special coming up on February 18th where we're going to uh, live stream the landing of the Perseverance spacecraft. We also have a lot of science programming that we do, virtual science that we're doing, 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 I'll get it out yet. <laughs> uh, during the week, uh, during the daytime uh, for schools. So, uh, we are continuing to be very active, even though the uh, museum itself is closed. Uh, so we do need a, a source of continuing revenue, and that's where those donations can really help us out. So if you take a moment um, to uh, click the donate button on the Facebook page, if you're on Facebook, if you're on uh, YouTube, you can go to the Chabot Space and Science Center website, chabotspace.org. And you'll see a donate button at the top of the web page there. Uh, make a donation. Help us out. We would really appreciate it. All right. Yeah. And I should also acknowledge, you probably saw the slide uh, before we started. Uh, Fremont Bank has made a very gen generous donation to help us out. So we really appreciate Fremont Bank for doing that. All right. Well, we're all set up. You want to get started? We better yeah. hurry before the clouds come in. It's That's right. Yeah, we're, we're playing beat the clouds there. tonight. So uh, let's start yeah, with the Orion Nebula. And uh, I'm going to share my screen here and get going. There we go. Bear with me here. So we're uh, up here at the Chabot Space and Science Center. Uh, we're in our one of our observatories. We have three observatories. Uh, the one we're in houses our 36-inch reflecting telescope, which is our newest telescope. And is that a live view? That is a <laughs> not a quite a live view. But I think he's cheating. It, no, I'm not. It's a 30-second view. <laughs> okay. That's, that is not too bad at all. I, yeah, thought, I, I thought that was your refined view. No, yeah, no. Last yeah. time. That's great. No, no, I'll show that a little later. This is just a uh, single 30 second shot taken through the camera uh, while you were talking about Fremont Bank. <laughs> All right. Well, well, this is the Orion Nebula, the Great Orion Nebula, also known as M42. It's a huge cloud of gas and dust about 1300 light years away. And this cloud is condensing and forming new stars. Um, this is how most stars form uh, from condensing clouds of gas and dust, and they often uh, form in clusters. So you, you get literally hundreds of stars forming within this cloud. <clears throat> and there's a few stars that have already uh, turned on, if you will. They've already started the fusion process. And some of those stars are very hot, more massive than our sun, so they burn hotter. So you see kind of in the middle, uh, four stars, very bright stars. We call those four stars the trapezium. And the trapezium consists of uh, some very, very hot, very young stars um, that are putting out a lot of energy. Uh, and a lot of that energy is actually in the form of ultraviolet radiation. And they're putting out so much energy that they're actually pushing the cloud away from them. So they have created a pocket within the cloud. And uh, you can see that. If you look carefully, you can actually see that the clouds around are actually kind of partially surrounding uh, the trapezium. And there's an opening that 
faces toward us very conveniently so we can see the trapezium real nicely. Now, uh, you see three stars down to the lower left there. And some people say, well, if this is in the constellation Orion, those must be Orion's belt. And that's actually not the case. Everything you see in the field of view is very small on the sky. Uh, in fact, if you imagine holding a soda straw at arm's length and looking through it, the amount of sky that we see looking through that soda straw is actually a little bit bigger than the field of view of this image that you're looking at. So those three stars are actually just a, a small uh, segment of the Orion constellation. The, everything you see is in the sword of Orion. So if you look at the Orion constellation with your naked eye, you'll see the three stars that are lined up that we call the belt of Orion. And we can see those easily with the naked eye. And just below the belt of Orion, you'll see a fainter string of stars we call the sword of Orion. Some people call it the dagger. And <clears throat> what we're looking at in this image is actually just a small part of the center of the sword. So those three stars are not part of the, um, the belt. Uh, one of those stars is actually emerging from the cloud. One of them uh, is actually a foreground star. It's closer to us than the cloud. And then we learned last week uh, that one of those stars is actually beyond the cloud, on the other side of the cloud. So it's kind of shining through a thinner part of the cloud. And then the cloud itself is mostly hydrogen also some helium and much smaller quantities of other gases, including oxygen. And the light from those uh, stars is lighting up the cloud, but the, infra the or, I'm sorry, the ultraviolet radiation from those stars is also ionizing the cloud. And some of those clouds have a little bit of oxygen in them. And when you ionize oxygen, it glows really bright in a kind of a greenish, turquoise color. And so you can see that pretty readily. You also see some fringes of red or pink. That's from the hydrogen. Hydrogen is actually the most abundant gas, but because uh, hydrogen glows at a much fainter level uh, in that red color, uh, it doesn't dominate the image. The oxygen dominates, even though it's not the dominant gas in the cloud. Hey, Gerald. Yeah. You might you might want to pull your mic away from your mask a little bit. Oh, am I rubbing it? Yeah, it sounds okay. like it's got it sounds like it got food in there. <laughs> hey, hey, we've got a, a great question. We little V wants to know if we can show a, a planet with two stars. Sounds very Star Wars like to me, but I don't I don't know how we would do that. A planet yeah. with two stars. A planet with two star <laughs> a planet with two suns. Yeah. You mean like Tatooine? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 there's, you know, some scenes in Star Wars, the original <laughs> Star Wars, if you want to see Planet with Two Stars, you know. <laughs> um, actually, actually, we are going to look at a double star here in a little while. Um, in fact, it's not too far away from the object we're looking at right now. Yeah, uh, and maybe there's a planet around them. Who knows? It, it could be. Yeah, we don't know. It could be. So anyway, uh, this is typical of... Uh, star forming nebulae the word nebula means cloud uh, uh, singular version is nebula the plural version is nebulae and uh, the word nebula means cloud and there are different types of nebulae out there there are clouds that are condensing and forming new stars <clears throat> there are also clouds that are the remnants of dying stars so this particular one is a cloud where new stars are forming uh, now you can see some bright stars that have already emerged from the cloud, but if we were able to zoom way in on different regions of this cloud, uh, and I mean really zoom in in high resolution like what the Hubble Space Telescope can do, you would see lots of little, like little blobs, which are actually the cocoons around new stars that are still in the formation process. And they're cocoons of dense gas and dust. Um, and there are quite a few of those within this cloud. 
when when all is finished, there's probably going to be a thousand stars or so that will have formed out of this cloud. Um, and eventually the gas and uh, dust will have disappeared, leaving behind all these thousands of stars drifting through space together as a group in what we call an open star cluster. And eventually they will drift apart from each other. Uh, but that's, you know, millions of years from now. So anyway, this is the Great Orion Nebula. It's one of the coolest things in the sky. It's very easy to find. You can see it easily with a pair of binoculars. Sometimes if you're in a really dark location, you can just barely make it out with naked, the, your naked eye. But it's easy to see in binoculars and even a small telescope will show you quite a bit of detail. So uh, definitely something to check out if you if you have a mind to. Um, we've been looking at this as frequently as we can over the last several weeks and, uh, you know, when, when we've had some clear skies. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll show a version of this that takes uh, about 15 minutes worth of uh, exposure time and has been processed to bring out a little bit more detail. Oh, yeah. it looks like you've been uh, looks like you've been shooting a bunch of pictures go. while we've been talking. There. I have been. You, 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 know, you, you never know what I might want to do later. But this <laughs> is a, uh, a pretty much a version of the same shot you were looking at. Uh, but it is a stack of a whole bunch of 30 second images and some uh, 10 second images as well to bring out the trapezium a little bit more kind of combined together in a high dynamic range uh, uh, shot. And uh, as you can see, as you gather more and more data through a camera, you're able to get more contrast, more color, less noise. And uh, this is uh, the result of doing that. And uh, just with some you know, lucky imaging from the 36-inch uh, scope here while uh, Gerald's giving his explanation of the uh, star formation in the Orion Nebula. So I thought I would share that. Well, what, the thing I, I really love about this is, you know, the first time somebody looks through a telescope at the Orion Nebula, there is no doubt about it that that is a huge cloud of gas and dust out in space. I mean, it looks, even in a small telescope, it looks like a cloud out in space. Uh, you know, when you get an image like this, and you can make out a lot of detail, different densities of clouds, different positions of clouds uh, relative to those bright stars. Uh, you see that kind of a dark blob up at the upper part of the screen. That's actually a little bit of a foreground cloud. Uh, so it's kind of, we're looking at the back side of it, the unlit side of it, if you will. Hey, here's a good question, a really good question. Um, do you chance, by chance know how many years it takes to form a new star in one of these clouds? Oh, that's a great question. It, it takes several hundred thousand to a, year, a million years for the star to eventually get dense enough and hot enough to where okay. the fusion process turns on. Those bright stars that you see um, the, in the trapezium, they're, they're barely a million years old, if that much. Um, so they have already, uh, you know, turned on, they're already uh, fusing hydrogen at their core. They've already cleared the gas and dust around them. And but, they're already getting near the end of their life. They're so, yeah, yeah, because they're so, they're so <clears throat> uh, excuse me, because they're so massive. They use up their fuel very rapidly. So those stars might make it to a few million years old, and then they're going to start the end of their life. Keep talking, John. I'm, I got something starting. <laughs> <Don't try. laughs> I think Charles, Charles has been diving into those snacks. That oh, maybe there. that's what it is. Yeah, we got some extra <laughs> snacks up here. And... Yeah. How you I'm doing there? You able to talk? Yeah, I'm putting it back so. on the. Uh, I think so. <laughs> live view here. Grabbed a drink of water there for just a second. <laughs> All right, I think think I'm going to survive. Good. So anyway, uh, you know we've we've uh, like I said, the, those four stars <clears throat> might make it to 100 million years old. 
but then they're going to uh, swell up and eventually they will explode in supernovae explosions. Yeah, I was uh, talking to Conrad once and he, he said uh, a lot of them, the, the really big ones won't even make it to two or three million years. They'll, they'll go that fast. Yes. So, you know, our, our sun, we, we measure the masses of stars based on the, the mass of our sun. So, you know, a star can have one solar mass. It can have two or three or four stars that have more than eight solar masses um, are the ones that are able to die in a supernova explosion, whereas less than eight solar masses, they die in a much slower process. <clears throat> but stars can have a lot more than one solar mass. They can have 20, 30, or 40 solar masses. And those are the stars that burn through their fuel very fast, only last a few million years, and then they're done. So, <clears throat> you know, as a star, it's a lot better if you decide to be small, low mass, cool, you'll live a long time. The, the hot, big guys, they don't last very long. So take that for what it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> read, read into that all you want. Yeah. Well, I'm, not, I'm, going to avoid drawing, I'm going to avoid drawing any analogies here. <laughs> <laughs> all right what's okay. next on our list well you know nearby speaking of planets with two stars not too far away from the orion nebula is the star sirius sirius is a is the brightest star in the night sky uh, if you go up, uh, go out and look and find Orion, Orion is a very easy constellation to find. <clears throat> and if you find Orion and you look kind of a little south uh, east of, of Orion, you'll see a very bright star. And that is Sirius. Sirius is a little over eight light years away. And it is a binary star system. There are two stars. Now, one of the stars is the, the really bright one. It's the one we see when we look at the sky. It's quite bright. Uh, that star is hotter than our sun. It's about twice the diameter of our sun. And uh, it has a companion called a white dwarf. Now, the, the bigger one is... is uh, Still in the in what we call a main sequence star, it's still still burning its uh, fuel. But the the white dwarf is the remnant of a star that has actually reached the end of its life. So the white dwarf is very small; it's only about the diameter of the Earth. So you got one star that's maybe, or the main star that's maybe a little less than two million miles in diameter, and then the white dwarf that's maybe eight or ten thousand miles in diameter. Um, the white dwarf orbits in a highly elliptical orbit around Sirius in such a way that sometimes it's so close, we can't even distinguish that there's two stars there. And then every once in a while, it gets farther away. So why don't I slew to Sirius? And then we can maybe see if we can see that second star, because right now... Sirius, the, the, what we call Sirius B, the, the white dwarf, is in the part of its orbit where it's getting pretty far away from uh, Sirius A, the, the main star. Okay. All You're right. down at the bottom of uh, my screen yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I see it. So we're going to have to try to adjust the exposure to uh, see if we can bring out Sirius B. Get that centered up. I already see it. So let's uh, see what we can do here. All right. How's that? Yeah, it's good. Uh, let's try cutting this exposure way down. And that's too much. Go to 30. You say you can see it? I thought I did. Hold on. I could be lying. I think, yeah. Oh, 
I believe it's over here, but I'm not completely certain. We zoom in a little bit, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Hold on. Oh, I think yeah. I see. You think you see how it keeps popping over right, here? Right there. Yes. Yeah. So, so Sirius B is like I say, it's a white dwarf. It's in. <clears throat> Still got things stuck in my throat here. It's do you, have, a, do you I, have a cup? I got some cold water if you want to. I, I've got a, a, a bottle of water over here. All right, good. Um, so it's in a highly elliptical orbit. Uh, and astronomers at first didn't see it. As you can see, right now it's actually pretty far away from the main star, but you really can't make it out very well. Yeah, I mean, we're looking, we're looking right here. Right. And you'll see it pop in and out. And the seeing isn't so great tonight. There's a lot of uh, atmospheric distortion. But you can see that uh, that there is something there. So yeah. so just a little history. Back in 1844, uh, an astronomer named Bessel <clears throat> noticed that as he plotted the position of Sirius over a period of time, that it seemed to change year to year to year and when he plotted it it looked like the star was wobbling in the sky uh, so it kind of made a sine wave pattern if you will as if he plotted it over the course of many years and he wasn't quite sure what was going on but he speculated that it might be because there's another star orbiting around it so close that you can't make it out and then uh, someone dear, near and dear to our hearts here uh, was observing it in, I believe it was 1862. Oh. And that was Alvin Clark. Oh, really? Uh, oh, Alvin cool. Clark and Sons. And he is the first one to officially have spotted the companion star. So... Alvin Clark is, uh, he and his sons uh, had a telescope making company, very famous telescope making company. And we are particularly fond of him because we have an Alvin Clark telescope up here at the Chabot Space and Science Center. One of our observatory telescopes was made by Alvin Clark and sons. So he is the first one to actually have seen the companion star. And I think you're right. Every once in a while, boy, it, you can just barely see that little pinpoint of light that, that actually is separate from the main star. Yep. So I've, I've got uh, some a graphic here if I can share. Yeah. Yeah. You got sharing rights. Go for all it. Right, all right. All I have to do is find it. <laughs> That's not it. Uh, now we're going to read your email. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. Hang on here. Okay, I'll try one more time. There we go. Okay. So this is Sirius A, the main star, and this is the orbital path oh, wow. of Sirius B over time, starting with the year 2000, when it was relatively close to the main star. And now it's way out here, right about here. And so that's why now is a good time to be looking, because as you can see, this is when it's most distant uh, almost the most distant from uh, the main star. So it starts to separate. When it's down in this part of its orbit, we can't make it out. It's it's just lost in the light of, of uh, Sirius A. But when it gets out this far away, that's when we're able to uh, pick it out. So anyway, um, you wanted to see two stars in the night sky. Here you are. <laughs> now, whether yeah, that's... That's always a challenge too. I've I've tried to uh, uh, look for that in uh, telescope many times, and really only about 
you know, 20% of the time am I able to see the companion star yeah, at yeah, best. You, you really need to have high resolution uh, telescope and uh, really good seeing conditions in order to, yep. to pick it out. Yeah. But still, you know, we, we were able to see it occasionally there. So, all right. So you wanted to see a, a double star system and now you got it. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, definitely there okay so what else we're gonna do tonight yeah, it's starting to clear up a little bit maybe yeah 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 we really have a, a lot of choices um what did you uh what did you put on your list uh for this evening Gerald? well i was thinking uh, we would, we might look at m46 which is an open star cluster uh, that's a good yeah that's a good choice it's a little low in the sky, but uh, not too far from where we are right now. Yeah, so. it's it's clear over in that direction, so that's a good idea. We okay. still have a, we're still fighting a lot of clouds tonight, so that's the good part of the sky to be in. <laughs> hey, here's a good one. How many galaxies and other objects are we missing out on because they're right behind a very bright star? Oh, <laughs> well, don't know, you know, I guess. <laughs> no way. That's a, that's a really great question, because if you think about it, we're missing out on a whole bunch of galaxies uh, because they're on the other side of the brightest part of the Milky Way from us. Yeah, yeah of course. Right? Yeah. I mean, there's including galaxies that would, you know, fill a good part of the sky because they're in collision with the Milky Way. Right. But they're in the other side. Right. So we can't oh. we can't see them. Although oh. we're actually coming up on the time of the year when all the galaxies that are away from the, from uh, the Milky Way because of the angle that the Earth's orbit is relative to the plane of the orbit of the Milky Way galaxy, we're going to be in, in position here starting in, in just about a month where we'll be able to see a whole lot of galaxies. Yeah, and galaxy clusters. Right, right. Uh, you know, in maybe two or three weeks, we'll be able to see the the clusters, there's a couple of galaxy clusters in the constellation Leo. Uh, we'll be able to see some uh, galaxies up in, in Ursa Major. So, um, you know, stick with us, folks, for a couple of weeks here, and we're going to be uh, going galaxy crazy for a while. <laughs> so, if, yeah. if we get good viewing. Hey, we yeah, got a question yeah. from Margo. Uh, we're wondering why the orbit, and I assume this, this is a serious uh, and serious, serious A and B, why the orbit is so elliptical? Well, there's no wondering about it. It's it's, it's all about mass, the different sizes. Right. Um, you want to elaborate on that or? Well, you know, you can pretty, start, yeah, you can start by saying that very rarely do you see anything other than elliptical orbits well, that's in true. space. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, everything, it, everything yeah. orbits. Everything is, a, yeah. Yeah, yeah a perfectly Some circular. Some are more elliptical than others, but. Yeah, yeah, perfectly circular orbit for a celestial object is just about impossible. It's like trying to balance on the head of a pin. So because of the various forces involved and the relative motions of, of the stars when they fo are forming and so on, they just don't want to form in perfect circular orbits. They want right. to form elliptical orbits. But in this case, where Sirius and uh, or Sirius A and Sirius B, the, there's such a, a, a big difference in mass that causes a more elliptical orbit. Right. Okay, well, let's see. M46, All are right. we ready? We are ready. I think we're zoomed in a little bit there, so you might Yeah, wanna... yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start adjusting here while you're doing that. Okay, we're there. Probably okay. need about 15 or 20 seconds of exposure yeah. time. Yep. All right, let's give it a start. So we were talking a little while ago about the Orion constellation and the Orion Nebula where new stars are forming. And I told you that that's how stars typically form in huge clouds of gas and dust. <clears throat> and those in, within those clouds, you get hundreds or even thousands of stars forming at roughly the same time. Uh, when it's all over with, 
uh, the gas and dust uh, disappears. And what's left behind is a cluster of stars. And uh, we're looking at one of those clusters right now. Although I think this cluster is so big, it really doesn't look like much of a cluster. Yeah, it looks like a nice field of stars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what's happened is uh, the the uh, object called M46 is a open star cluster. It's several hundred stars that all formed from a cloud of gas and dust like the Orion Nebula. And the cloud has now dissipated and left behind all these stars. And they're sort of drifting around the galaxy together. And as they orbit the galaxy, because they're not all at exactly the same distance from the center of the galaxy, their orbital velocities are slightly different. And over the, a period of millions of years, that slight difference in orbital velocity uh, will cause the stars to separate from each other. So initially, they're they're bunched together pretty close, but over time, they start spreading out. And this one's obviously spread out a lot. Um, and there are quite a few of these out there. Uh, in fact, there are a couple of them that you can see with your naked eye. Um, in fact, if you go outside right now and look in the direction of the constellation Taurus the bull, um, you'll see in Taurus uh, a tiny little cluster of stars that you can see with your naked eye. It's called the Pleiades. And the Pleiades is another open star cluster, stars that all formed out of the same cloud of gas and dust. But unlike this star cluster here, the Pleiades can actually be seen with the naked eye. Um, and the interesting thing about the Pleiades, so we call it the Pleiades. Sometimes we call it the Seven Sisters, referring to a story in Greek mythology. The Japanese call it Subaru. And if you look at the emblem on a Subaru car, it shows the six brightest stars in the constellation or in the open star cluster called the Pleiades. So, and if, if you don't know, if you don't know where the uh, the Taurus constellation is take the, th the three stars in orion's belt and follow them up and to the right and they'll kind of point directly at the pleiades right and then and and to the sort of down into the left of the pleiades and still within the constellation taurus you'll see a bright yellowish star called aldebaran and if you look carefully around aldebaran you'll see kind of a v-shaped uh, cluster of stars that's actually another open star cluster it's called the Hyades and it's another one that you can see with your naked eye so there are quite a few of these open star clusters out there and again they're all stars that formed at about the same time out of a huge cloud of gas and dust the stars are all roughly the same distance away from us uh, so one of the cool things about it is that uh, whatever differences in properties that we see, they're intrinsic to the stars. They're not because some stars are much farther away or some stars are much older or younger. Uh, the stars are all about the same age and they're all about the same distance. So if one star looks brighter than another star, when you get up close to it, it really is brighter than the other star. And if one star looks a different temperature or looks to be a different age, that really is a, an age difference. It's not because of where it is relative to the other star. Right. Hey, uh, Lucas would like to know, how many planets has Voyager 1 discovered so far? I'm not aware that Voyager 1 has discovered any no, uh, planets. No. But it is pretty far away at this point. It's, yeah. it's right at, at the... It's actually beyond the edge of our solar system. Huh? Well, it's at what's called the heliopause, which is, you know, the, the sun is generating a very strong solar wind. That solar wind is blowing charged particles out away from the sun, and that they have a fair amount of velocity. The solar wind is what cause what causes the auroras that we see, uh, you know, the so-called northern lights. Uh, that's the solar wind interacting with the Earth's magnetic field. The solar wind uh, actually blows out at a fairly high velocity and blows out away from the sun in all directions. 
In the meantime, the sun itself is orbiting the galaxy. And as it's orbiting the galaxy, it's passing through very thin clouds of gas and dust. Uh, we call it the interstellar medium. Um, and that creates a very faint wind that's basically blowing back toward us. It's just like when you ride your bicycle down the street, you feel wind blowing in your face. Well, it's actually because you are moving into the through the air. So the sun is moving through this interstellar medium, creating a wind toward us. But the sun is producing a solar wind, which is pushing away from the sun. At the point where those two winds balance, we call the heliopause. And that's where Voyager 1 is right now. It's several billion miles away from the sun. And Voyager is passing through that region and out into what you might consider interstellar space. Although even at that distance, there are still objects orbiting around the sun, uh, the Oort cloud objects. So, uh, you know, it won't be until Voyager 1 is a light year or more away from the sun that it has truly left our solar system. All right. Well, we are uh, looking at the one part of the sky that is not covered by clouds at this point. So uh, I think I think it might be a good time to uh, talk about the uh, the recent asteroid discovery. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, yeah you've about that. Yeah. So for most people don't know this, but uh, when I'm uh, not doing one of these things, I also do. Uh, asteroid work. Uh, we have a program here at Chabot Space and Science Center where we use this same telescope to search for and track near-Earth asteroids. And in particular, we focus on newly discovered or unconfirmed new discoveries of near earth possible near earth asteroids so what happens is one of the other observatories around the world especially the survey telescopes which are telescopes that have very big fields of view they're big telescopes with very wide fields of view <clears throat> if they spot something moving and then we can't immediately identify it as a known asteroid they report that to an organization called the minor planet center and the minor planet center will uh, then request other observatories to try to confirm uh, that object and determine whether or not it's an actual asteroid. Uh, so uh, we're going to see if we can't uh, hang on here while I play around with my imaging here. <clears throat> we Last night, uh, we found out about a possible new uh, asteroid discovery. And so I was able to very quickly uh, point our telescope in the right direction and I found it. So bear with me here while I... Remind me not to eat a granola bar before going on the air. <laughs> so, all right. So, so that's what it is. A granola. Yeah, yeah, I ate a granola bar and I'm really paying for it here. So, okay. So these are three actual oh, images wow. Look at that. taken last night. And you can see the asteroid right there. So this asteroid now has the designation 2021 CO and it is a near earth asteroid that actually uh, is going to pass uh, what, what did I say it was uh, two days I think it is or something like that pass a little bit closer than the moon uh, past the earth at uh, about that distance and we were able to spot it last night. We submitted the data to the Minor Planet Center and 
when they combined that with the data from the original observation, they were able to better characterize the orbit. And then some other observatories were able to get even more data. And eventually they had enough data to where they could say, yep, this is a real object and we can say with a fair amount of certainty what the orbit is. So they gave it an official designation and added it to the catalog of known near earth asteroids. Now this, these images kind of show you exactly how we find asteroids. We take multiple pictures of the same part of the sky and the stars will all stay put, but the asteroid will pick it out as a moving object. And so these, it's just three frames out of a set of, I think, six or eight that I took all together. But I want to point out a couple of things that you'll see in here. So this is the asteroid right here, this guy that's moving here. Uh, but there's a couple of other interesting things. If you watch over here, in one of the three frames, there's a bright flash that shows up there. That's a cosmic ray strike. Cosmic rays are highly charged subatomic particles that are flying around space. And every once in a while, they pass through our atmosphere. And if your camera happens to get in the way, they will hit a couple of pixels on your camera and cause them to flash. And so we get these flashes like this every once in a while. And there's actually a couple others, uh, I think, uh, there's one right here. Um, and and sometimes when we're doing this work, we have to kind of do a little work to make sure we're not trying to track an asteroid that turns out to be just cosmic ray strikes. So, uh, you know, fortunately, they look very different when you, when you zoom in on them. They look very different than an asteroid does. But anyway, I thought it was interesting that uh, this just happened last night, actually very early this morning. And uh, we were able to track it and get some imagery and get some data and submit it. And now it's part of the official record of Asteroid 2021 CO. That's great right. stuff. All hey, right. while, we're, while we're talking about asteroids, something I want to share. Um, I'm going to grab the screen here for a minute. Okay. So this is, a new, this is a new story uh, I came across this morning, and uh, it was, it's about research that's been done on two craters near Stuttgart, Germany. And it's always been considered an oddity because there's actually a, uh, there, was, there was a fairly plausible argument that it was a double strike, that it was actually uh, two craters caused by the same asteroid that broke up in the atmosphere and struck in two nearby locations. But that's exceedingly rare. And also uh, there was a lot of uh, geological data that was suggesting otherwise. And the otherwise is what, uh, one out. Uh, and it was actually two separate craters that struck between 10 and 15 uh, million years ago in the mid Miocene. And what you can see here is uh, a 40 mile in diameter crater that was probably caused by a one mile uh, wide piece of rock from space. And uh, it's closest to a town called uh, Nordlingen in Germany. And what, one of the interesting things about it is uh, Nordlingen has this beautiful old church. And the stone that this church is made of is melted rock from the meteors, uh, from the asteroid strike. Uh -huh. And uh, so it's a very it's a very unique rock, and they were able to correlate it with the uh, with the uh, geologic features uh, around that crater. So I thought that was kind of neat. Yeah, Pe Carol, are... I have a good question for you. Okay. Um, uh, Brandon says, "How do you determine that it's indeed a new asteroid?" Well, sometimes it isn't. Yeah, yeah actually, sometimes actually, it's yeah. a most rediscovered. Time, yeah. yeah, actually, most of the time, th what we see are asteroids that are known asteroids. So you know, we see you know something moving across the sky, and we are able to look up data uh, for that part of the sky at that time and determine if there is uh, a known asteroid there. In fact, the software that I use when I'm uh, analyzing these images, actually 
maintains a catalog of known asteroids. And anytime we see something in an image, one of the first things we do is we click on that object and the software will tell us if there are any known asteroids at that location. And we'll actually, if, if we blink through the images, it will actually show where the known asteroid should be compared to the asteroid that we're seeing. So we're able to determine fairly quickly whether or not it's a known asteroid versus an unknown asteroid. But, but sometimes you have asteroids that you find and then lose again, and we could lose track uh, of them. Uh, often, they often. They find them again. Yeah. Now, you know, one of the things that, that happens with the asteroids, um, you know, the asteroid last night, we've only got two days worth of data on it. This asteroid takes about three years to orbit around the sun. So two days worth of uh, orbital observations is only a tiny fraction of the total orbit. Now you can do a pretty good job of calculating the orbit, but you really want to watch it over a much longer period of time to get the orbit real accurate. And what you're interested in is, can I see it again when it comes back around to where it's going to be close to the Earth again? And to do that, you have to have an accurate orbit to predict where it's going to be. What happens is a lot of uh, asteroids that are discovered and cataloged, uh, because it's so long before anybody sees them again, we sort of lose them. And what happens is, um, you know, years later, some astronomers out there and he sees an asteroid and he says, aha, this is a new asteroid, reports it, everybody uh, uh, checks it and verifies it and says, yes, it's a new asteroid. But then the Minor Planet Center starts doing some additional analysis and realizes, no, it's actually a asteroid that we lost years ago. And that happens actually quite often. In fact, just today, I got an email from the Minor Planet Center uh, showing an asteroid that was discovered in 20, I believe it was in 2019, and it turned out it's the same asteroid as one discovered in, I think it was 2011 or something like that. And, and you know, you might be wondering, how do you lose something that big? But the, yeah. the, reason, <laughs> the reason it gets, quote unquote, lost is because uh, if you miscalculate the orbital elements early in the process and, you know, because the data is, you know, a little bit, you know, uh, off or, you know, the observing nights weren't that good, um, then, uh, you know, a year down the road, it has a magnifying error. Right. And so oh, yeah. You, you, yeah. you think you, you know the orbital elements of this object when in fact you were off by some percentage. And then when you look for it later, it's suddenly gone. And then if you apply some correction to it, you realize, oh, we were off by 0.02 or something like that. Then, uh, oh, that, that must be what we're looking at now because yeah. now it's in the right place. Yeah. Yeah. Very small errors in the predicted orbit today can translate into very big errors, you know, three or four years from now. So that's why it's so important. Even after we discover and catalog this asteroid, we need to continue to observe it over time to continue to improve and refine the orbit uh, calculation. When it's really pinned down to where they, we've seen it multiple orbits around the sun, we've got the orbit real precisely determined they actually change the designation of the asteroid. Right now it has a, a designation that just refers to the year, month, and sequence in which it was discovered. Uh, but if they get enough data years from now, uh, they will add a new designation to it, just a, a long number. And so then it'll become asteroid 97846 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's at that point that the original discoverer of the asteroid has the option to name it. So naming conventions for asteroids is a little bit different than it is for comets. With comets, they name the comet right away. As soon as it's discovered and confirmed, it's named and it's named after either the person who discovered it or the observatory that discovered it, like Neil Wise uh, last spring was discovered by the Neil Wise spacecraft. Um, so that's where the name came from. So with comets, the name is applied right away. With asteroids, it can be 10 years or more if 
it gets a name at all. So uh, different rules for asteroids and for comets. So uh, uh, Meg wants to know, how can you tell the difference between an asteroid, a shooting star, and satellites or space junk out in space? That's yeah, a good question. Well, uh, mostly by how fast they're moving. Also, sometimes the pattern of light and so on. Uh, just to give you a good example, uh, we've, we've got a really good one going on right now. Um, back in the 1960s, uh, there was a spacecraft that was launched and had an upper stage called a Centaur upper stage. And the Centaur went, was, you know, after, after it put the satellite into orbit, <clears throat> the Centaur was just ejected and it sort of just drifted off into an orbit around the sun. And it's been orbiting around the sun for all these years. Recently, it came in view again of observatories. And the initial thought was it's a near earth asteroid with a funny orbit because it's almost identical to the earth's orbit. And for a while, it seemed to be actually kind of tracking the Earth. Um, eventually, they determined that, in fact, it was not an asteroid. It was the upper stage of this old rocket. And it has some distinguishing characteristics. Its velocity relative to the Earth is very slow. Uh, its light curve suggests a tumbling, very bright object. So if you imagine the, the upper stage of a, a rocket booster, it's probably painted white or some light color. So depending on the angle it is to the sun, it's either going to be very bright or it could be very dim. And if it's tumbling, you'll see a regular pattern of bright and dim, bright and dim. And there's other characteristics as well. Um, and of course, if they can shoot uh, radar at it, they can actually see the, the physical shape of it. So it's not unusual for us to sometimes mistake space junk for asteroids, but usually after some analysis, we can figure out the difference. Um, satellites that are in orbit around the Earth, they pass through our images so fast that we don't see them as points of light, like what you saw just, just now. We see them as streaks of light, and they pass through very quickly. Uh, you know, even a 10 second exposure, an ast or a satellite in orbit around the Earth is not going to show up as a, as a dot. It's going to show up as a bright streak. All right. Any other questions about asteroids? Uh, well, I, I think I already answered one. Um, Shauna wanted to know if it would be possible to place a tracking. Uh, device on an asteroid yes it would but it would be very very expensive to do that yeah uh, and sending out a, a, a space or cre creating a space mission to send out a, a tracking device to each asteroid that we came across would be very difficult it sounds like a job for elon musk keep keep in mind there are millions of asteroids out there so right no. Well, he has millions of satellites out there. So. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, that's a whole other subject. Yeah. <laughs> I see that there's uh, some organization that's now officially suing uh, SpaceX about uh -oh. the Starlink system. Oh, so, so. Somebody asked, uh, what's the difference between the comet and an asteroid? And it's actually pretty subtle. Uh, we used to think of comets and asteroids as being two different things, completely separate from each other. But it turns out they're not. They're sort of a part of a continuum. Comets are mostly ice. Asteroids are mostly rock or metal. Um, and, and what you can have is actually a body that starts out as a comet. It's mostly ice with a lot of rock and, and dust and stuff embedded within it. That comet makes a few trips around the sun each time, causing the ice, at least the ice near the surface, to sublimate away, uh, eventually leaving behind just rock and dust. So it now looks like an asteroid. And, and then there are other asteroids out there that we look at them. We say, well, that's just, you know, big old rocky body out there uh, with a lot of gravel on it and things. And then another asteroid bumps into it. And lo and behold, all this ice and water and 
gases come flying off because there was ice embedded within the asteroid. It's actually an old comet. So um, there is not a fine distinguish, distinguishing line between asteroid and comets. But generally speaking, a comet is a body that is mostly ice with embedded rock and, and dust and so on. And an asteroid is mostly rock. It can either be a whole bunch of rocks piled together or it can one, be one what we call monolithic rock. Uh, it depends. Uh, but, but that's the distinguishing feature, icy versus rocky. Well, Jerome asked an interesting question. I'm not sure I understand it. Exactly. He says, what is the largest object we know of? After a certain, we've talked about solar masses, and after a certain number, does it collapse to a black hole? I, I think he, he's talking about stars. Or, yeah, I would or say perhaps a black hole. I'd say the answer is different depending on whether you're talking about stars or talking about galaxies, but he's probably talking yeah. about stars. Yeah. 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 So probably. 40 to 50 solar masses is kind of getting up there pretty pretty massive uh, but those objects at the end of their life they become black holes yeah and then black holes you've got a whole nother uh, oh, yeah. level there yeah. you've, yeah. you've got yeah. super massive black holes that could be millions of solar masses right right yeah in fact the, the super massive black hole at the center of our galaxy the center of the milky way galaxy it's four million solar masses um, and then in this, at the one at the center of uh, the Andromeda galaxy, I think I read somewhere it's 20 million solar masses. So. Yeah, and it's not because it started out that way. It's because right. it's uh, been, it, yeah. over a large amount of time, billions and billions of years, uh, it has uh, absorbed other stars and masses that have fallen into the black hole and yeah, increased right. mass right. as a result. Right. And right now, the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy is pretty quiet. It's not eating right now. And that's a good thing because when it starts eating something like, you know, another star, it puts out a lot of radiation. And that can be not good for us. So uh, we, want, we want our black hole to stay nice and quiet. Yeah. We don't want those black holes getting hungry. <laughs> right. Right. You you like you prefer the domesticated black holes, <laughs> exactly. right? Right. I I for I prefer sleeping giant black holes. You know? All right. All right. Well, let's see. What Somebody other would like to we know if we can show Vesta. Um, I don't know where Vesta is right now. No, maybe or we can. We can see it. Yeah, I'm not sure we're going to be able to see it, but let me see it. I think it yeah. is in the night sky. Hang on just a second here. Let me take a quick look. Good if you question. Can't see it tonight. It would be a great target for another night. Yeah. Right. We can put it on our list. Hang on here. Let me just look it up and see what what it says. Uh, Mark asks, do we have a way to protect the Earth from asteroids? Only in the movies. <laughs> yeah. I mean, nobody really knows how to stop one. Uh, the, the most we could do is prepare ourselves if uh, there was going to be one. Not that I'm sure we'd be able to effectively do that either. But, uh, you know, there's some uh, speculation that if you uh, 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 create an explosion on an asteroid, uh, or you use, you know, a rocket against an asteroid when it's far enough away, you might perturb its orbit enough that it would miss us. Um, another another uh, hypothesis is that if you hit an asteroid with enough explosives, it breaks up into thousands of asteroids that then hit the Earth and causes even more damage. So uh, there's a lot of unknowns in this business. Yeah, there's there are some concepts like uh, gravity tractors. Yeah. Looks like Vesta would be too low in the sky for us. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. showing it's over showing, on the east. Yeah. yeah, it's showing way over there. Yeah, it, yeah. So, what's the well, gravity tractor? So, a gravity tractor is where you uh, send a spacecraft up to the asteroid. It's a very massive <laughs> spacecraft. John Deere makes them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 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 So uh, the gravity tractor is a, it's a massive spacecraft. You send it up and you put it in orbit so that you have the asteroid 
And then you have the spacecraft in front of the asteroid and, the, and they're orbiting together. And then you fire the thrusters on the spacecraft and you move away from it a little bit. And the mutual gravitation between the, the, the massive spacecraft and the asteroid, the asteroid gets pulled along. And so then you kind of point uh. the, the rocket so that it takes it, pulls it into a slightly different orbit. And if you do that years in advance right. of an impact, you can actually change the orbit enough to where it won't hit you. It takes a very small change if you do it many years in advance of the in impact. So that's, that's brilliant. What, that's pretty neat. Uh, the, the, yeah. the key is having enough time to actually influence right. it yeah. but in and such and a passive way. There's another concept called the impactor, uh, kinetic impactor. And we're actually going to be testing that in a couple of years. Uh, there's a mission called the DART mission, uh, double astronaut, asteroid, uh, I forget what all the acronym stands for. But they're going to go up to a binary asteroid system. It's an asteroid, a big asteroid with a smaller asteroid orbiting around it. And they're going to fire a big giant bullet into the smaller asteroid and try to change its orbit. And this is a test of using that technology to deflect an incoming asteroid. So there are ways to do it. Again, it's a very minor deflection and you have to do it well in a uh, very many years in advance, I guess. Right, right, right. You, you, you can't do it, uh, you know, three days before you, no. uh, right. before impact, you know, if you- if You, you, you got to get those orbital elements right too, because, right. you know, you don't want to send that big expensive uh, gravity tractor up to the asteroid and then discover it's not there. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, we we end up talking a lot about asteroids here instead of stars and planets. And things, yeah, so. but that, yeah. that's okay. You know, that's why we're here. That, right. That's what we could talk about tonight. You know, we know we're we're we have limited options with our sky tonight. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, any other questions? Yeah, do you check uh, YouTube? Did anybody have any questions on the YouTube side? Uh, uh, that was, that uh, was a question, just the Vesta one. Oh, oh somebody asked it. about Oumuamua. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 it's been in the news this week. Yeah, yeah. Oumuamua yeah. has been in the news again. Yeah, yeah. More people saying that it's actually an alien spacecraft. No, it's not. It's, uh, <laughs> my response is put down that copy of Rendezvous with Rama. And uh, look, at, look at look at yeah, look at the science, and um, the most likely exp explanation is usually the right one. Yeah. And the uh, notion that it is uh, an exhausted comet, where the uh, water and ice have all boiled off and left nothing more than a dry husk, is the most likely uh, explanation for this object. With, with, um, one, with one small caveat, it's an exhausted comet from another solar system. From another solar right, system, right. exactly. It right. was captured. It's an extrasolar system object, and it was captured uh, by our sun's gravity, and it took uh, a brief detour around the sun and then left us. Yep, yep. yep. And it had a very unusual shape, but kind of a long cigar shape, and if you read the book Rendezvous with Rama, <laughs> the original description of Rama, which is was an alien space scroll, was that it was a long cylindrical object looking like a cigar out in space. So when we were first started tracking the object, which ultimately was named Oumuamua, a lot of the astronomers were jokingly calling it Rama. So that was a lot of fun back then. Yeah. Well, it's one of my favorite books. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think it was around 2017 when that object was was yeah. first discovered. And you know, uh, we do asteroid tracking here at Chabot, and so we get emails about any new object that's unusual, you know, because everybody wants to get data on it. So uh, we were getting all this data and everybody was talking about how it looked and the kind of orbit and how it reminded you of rendezvous with Rama. So they were calling it Rama for a while, but eventually <laughs> the discoverers got to call it Oumuamua, which is a Hawaiian name. Uh, Mark, Mark, Mark asked oh, go a good ahead. question. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I saw that one. It was like, have we seen any 
and we've seen other interstellar comets other than that one. And, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Surprisingly, another one was uh, discovered about a year later. Uh, and I forget what they called it, but uh, it was not quite as uh, interesting as old Bloom was. So, so <laughs> you don't hear so much about it. Uh, so one, one of the interesting things about old Bloom was you know, as Richard said, it, it came in, it went around the sun, and then it went back out. And that would be typical. We, we expected at some point or another, an object from another solar system would pass our sun and do exactly that. It would come in uh, on uh, what we call a hyperbolic orbit. So it comes in from one direction, zips around the sun, and then it goes out in a different direction. Um, and so that part of it was perfectly normal. Everything was accepted. But as it was going out, it suddenly changed velocity. Mm -hmm. And that's when everybody said, wait a minute, that's not supposed to do that. Well, well we've since determined that there was an outgassing event going on. Like John said, this is a old spent comet. And so there was an outgassing event that actually caused it to change its velocity very slightly. And um, that's the explanation. That's my story. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. It's a better explanation, although there is a professor right now who really, really insists it's uh, an alien. Yeah. Uh, oh, that, well, uh, uh, you know, or a spacecraft. So, well, extraordinary claims require extraordinary, extraordinary evidence. evidence. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> Prove it. Yeah. That's a, that's a quote from Carl Sagan. You know, so. Okay. All well, right, guys. About uh, five after six, six months after 10, rather. It's five, 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 five after, after six. six. It's six yeah, after it's, something. The problem is, yeah, the problem is I'm on universal time. You know, when oh, you do asteroid work, you work on universal time. And, <laughs> and sometimes I get confused because it's, Yeah, that's a good excuse, it's, Gerald. It's, it's you know, it's actually <laughs> February 7th, uh, 06, 0606 on February 7th, universal time. So, so uh, you know, it gets confusing sometimes, you know. But that's because, you know, we're working internationally. The asteroid work is done internationally. We're always communicating with people across the globe in Europe and Asia and Australia, South America, so forth. So we all work on the same time scale or, or the same clock. Uh, and that makes it a lot easier to communicate with each other. All right, guys. Hey. Well, this was fun. Yeah. yeah. And uh, good to get up here the, again. Uh, great information tonight, Gerald. And right. thank you all for your questions tonight. They were excellent. Um, and we will uh, try this again next week. We'll hope for uh, maybe more than crossed. one tiny section of the sky. And uh, if and, not, and we'll I, have other things for you. And I won't eat any granola bars before. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> We're putting you on a yogurt-only diet. Yeah, there, 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 there you go. Yeah. So, so, folks, once again, please remember to uh, hit that donate button. Uh, we do rely on your support to continue this programming and to get the Shimano Space and Science Center ready to reopen later on this year. So oh, we can't wait. We need right. your support to, to get us ready to do that. So click on that donate button, please. All right. All right. Hey. Thank you, everyone. Have good a good night, night. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.